Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, we're here now for the next session, which is going to be presented by me. Um, I'm Jeff Urban. I'm the Education Director here at the Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum in Hyde Park, New York. I'm delighted to, uh, to be here today to, to present and delighted, I have the honor uh, and delight to, uh, to host the, the conference today. And we have so many people to thank for, for putting this together um, today. I'm not going to list everybody out um, because I know I'll forget somebody and then they'll, you know, they'll have their, their feelings hurt. But this is a team effort. This is a, is a, is a team um, a team project. It's been going on for many, many months, and I'm just so happy that uh, so many folks are, are here today. So in my session, what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about um, what we do here at the Roosevelt Presidential Library, and I'm going to introduce you all to a curriculum guide um, that I put together about a year and a half ago, um, just before the, um, the pandemic struck, uh, I was working uh, uh, on this. But um, let me tell you a little bit about us first. We are the nation's very first presidential library the only presidential library that was ever used by a president while they were actually president. So if you come to our museum, you will see the president's study. It's the study that he used all throughout his third term and throughout the 83 days of his, uh, his fourth term. And in our collection, we have 17 and a half million pages of documents. Now, that's a big number, hard to get your head around that. Imagine uh, the Washington Monument in Washington, DC. You've all seen that, you're familiar with that. Now imagine a stack of papers 16 times as tall as that. That'll give you an idea of the amount of information that we have here uh, in the library and uh, museum. So uh, the Washington Monument is 555 feet tall, and we would have um, 16 stacks of papers 555 feet tall if you were to add them all on top of each other. And so the curriculum guide that I put together about uh, the Holocaust uh, draws from some of that material. And in, a little bit later on, we're going to uh, meet with um, Dr. Abby Gondock, who has been our, our Morgenthau scholar, and she has been spending the last two years looking through these documents and pulling together the material that we have about uh, the Holocaust um, so that it'll be easier for teachers, it'll be easier for scholars, it'll be easier for everyone to get a sense of uh, how the Roosevelt administration handled the um, the Holocaust. Now, when we do our education programs here at the library, and we did about, we were having 35,000 students a year on site just before the, uh, the pandemic. Um, and then we also do this distance learning uh, around the world. One of the things that I, I always try to, to uh, base our our uh, programs on are, are what I call sort of three three principles. And um, these are, are things that I, I like to kind of keep in mind as I go through. The first thing is that we're planting seeds. So I can't tell you the whole story of Franklin Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, Great Depression, World War II, Roosevelt's involvement in the Holocaust, uh, you know, United Nations and all that sort of stuff in one session. And we can't do that today with this, with this conference. You know, as much ground as we're going to cover, we can't cover everything. What we hope to do is plant seeds, get folks excited about the information, get folks excited about the resources, get folks excited about the materials. So first thing we try to do is to plant seeds, and those seeds will grow over the course of time. The second thing we like to do with our programs is uh, to create points of departure. And this is this idea that, you know, when you educate a student, you don't just unscrew their head and pour information in and then screw their head back on and send them out the door. Um, that's not the way it works. What we try to do is to get kids to become critical thinkers, to think beyond what goes on in the classroom to their real lives, to the real world and to give them avenues that they can then go down to find out more information uh, about the material that we're talking about. So we try to cre uh, plant seeds, right? Get folks excited about the broad topic, create these points of departure. So if you're interested in a particular aspect of the story, we can point you in ways to go down uh, you know, avenues of, of research for that. And then the third thing is to create the current connection. In the mind of every student, you know it as well as I do, is the question of, so what? Why do I need to know this? Is this going to be on the test? Right? And that's in the minds of all of these students. You know, every now and I, I, I would get students, you know, my, my uncle owns a roofing company and I'm going to go work for him and I'm going to, you know, um, we have to, it's up to us to get them to understand why this stuff uh, is important. So that's what we try to keep in mind with all of our education programs. And it's the same thing with our curriculum guides um, as well. And I'm particularly proud of this, uh, this uh, 
particular uh, uh, curriculum guide because um, it brings together so many different uh, components. And um, it's based upon the film Nuremberg. Um, which was uh, a film, a documentary film made in 1946 about the Nuremberg trials. And um, a very important film. It was banned in this country for 65 years, and it only became available, I think it was two, uh, 2016, 2015, something like that. And um, then it became um, available for folks to, uh, to watch. Our friends at uh, Drake Creative, who are... Um, our tech team here today, um, they took this film, they broke it down into different sections so that you can watch these sections in class. You know, you don't have to watch the entire, you know, hour, 20 minute film. Um, you can break it down into individual sections and it breaks down the, um, the, the arc of what it was that uh, the Nazis uh, were trying to do. So why is this particular curriculum guide unique? And this is what it looks like. We put it in a book form. You can get it online. All you gotta do is go to our website, download it, and um, you know, put it in a nice book like this. I'm old school. I like to have the hard copy of stuff. And um, you know, you'll have a nice uh, curriculum guide uh, like this. And then the sections that of the film um, are on our YouTube page. So you're able to go and take a look at those. And I think we've got something like um, 250,000 uh, views uh, of this um, of this uh, this material since we uh, we put it on there. This is material that had been banned in this country for 65 years, and now we have uh, this number of, uh, of views. So what makes this particular curriculum guide unique? And what we're doing here is we're entering this into the discussion. This is not the end all end all of curriculum guides. This is just uh, an opportunity to enter into the fray, uh, the, the, uh, the Roosevelt aspect of this. Many people, uh, there's two sort of schools of thought with Roosevelt. Some people say he didn't do enough. Some people said he did what he could. And of course, the truth is probably someplace in between. What we've tried to do with this curriculum guide is to present the facts as we have them, the primary source documents, the material from the film, and um, you know, lay it out there so that we get a more complete and a fuller picture of uh, the Roosevelt's um, reaction uh, to the Holocaust. One of the themes I think you're going to see coming over and over and over again uh, in this conference today is the need for truth, right? the need to present the facts, the need to, prevent, uh, to present the evidence, the need to uh, get to the, the uh, primary source, the authentic document, the authentic storyteller, the authentic uh, films, so that we're able to tell that story uh, with the primary source that was created at the time or nearby um, you know, when, the, um, when the actual event took place. This is the strength. This is the evidence that is necessary to combat uh, folks who are putting out false information uh, about what occurred. And we're very happy to have this now uh, as another part of the overarching story of the Holocaust. But let me tell you a little bit about this. So it's based on the, the Nuremberg trial film. And as I said, uh, this was a film, uh, it, was, it, was, it was put together from 150 hours of uh, a recorded uh, uh, trial uh, footage. Um, this was uh, putting some of the top Nazis on trial for the crimes that they had committed uh, during the war. And much of the evidence that was entered into uh, this trial was actually documents and film and um, you know books and papers and reports that the Nazis had created uh, themselves. So what made this uh, an interesting uh, and important trial in history is it's the first time, or one of the first times, that film is being introduced as a, uh, as a piece of evidence. It was also um, a time where civilization brought charges against defendants uh, with things such as crimes against humanity, crimes against peace, war crimes, and conspiracy. So this is the first time that these things are being put out there as actual um, uh, crimes. And... Um, the evidence that's presented against these Nazis is evidence in large measure that they created themselves. It's a very important film. It's going to be, we're going to be showing it during the lunch uh, time if you, um, if you have a chance to, to watch it. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about that uh, as we go through. So the curriculum guide is based upon the film. You can bring the film right into the classroom in bite-sized pieces that you can show 
uh, to students. There are some parts that have, you know, some of the more, um, you know, troubling and, and grisly images of the Holocaust. Um, you know, just be warned about that, warn the students about that. But there are other parts, um, you know, that you can show that, you know, lead, that show the lead up and such that don't necessarily, um, you know, have those, uh, those images in there. The other thing about this, um, this curriculum guide is it's going to provide you with primary source documents uh, from our collection. So you can show to your students the actual real life uh, you know, copies of documents that were produced in the government um, during the time of the Roosevelt's uh, as they were responding um, uh, to the Holocaust. And the other thing of course is that um, much of this evidence that uh, is presented in the film is from the Nazis themselves. Now, um, what makes this a credible source, this, uh, this curriculum guide, is that the information that is in here um, is uh, information that has been vetted across uh, time and across uh, places. Um, so for example, when you're looking at this film, this is a film that has been around now for 80 years. Uh, it's been seen around the world. It's now being seen in this country. And it was, um, put together um, filming the trial, which was an international tribunal uh, to try the Nazis at the end of the war. And um, the materials and the documents that you find in here are from the National Archives. So these are very credible sources. These are very credible documents and you can feel comfortable um, using those uh, in, in class. There are also um, documents that were created not after the fact, but uh, at the time during the fact. And what's interesting about this particular curriculum guide is you can begin to see as more information is being made available to the Roosevelt administration, you can begin to see the movement. You can begin to see um, the, um, the progression, the transition uh, in, uh, in a direction uh, moving uh, through this. And this document, uh, this curriculum guide will provide you with over two dozen documents uh, from our collection. And I want to share some of those, um, <clears throat> excuse me, with you uh, this morning. So here is a document, and I'm going to use my fancy camera technique here, I hope, to focus in on this. And you may not be able to make this out so well, but this is the flyleaf of Franklin Roosevelt's copy of Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. And uh, President Roosevelt had read the book in its original German. He was able to do that because he had traveled to Germany many times as a child growing up, and he, he was able to, uh, to read and, and speak some German. And Roosevelt had read the original Mein Kampf book. And in that book was all of the anti-Semitism, the hate, the violence, uh, you know, the venom. Um, as Paul had, had mentioned earlier. Uh, and he saw that and, he, and he, he was able to, to take a look at that. When the book was pre presented here in the United States, it was a sanitized version. Much of the anti-Semitism had been taken out and Hitler was portrayed in that book as not as terrible as he actually was. Now you probably can't make out what this handwriting says. So I will read this to you. And this is in um, President Roosevelt's own hand. Um, he says, uh, this translation is so expurgated as to give a wholly false view of what Hitler really is and says. The German original would make a different story. So this is um, from 1933, President Roosevelt uh, is, is writing this in this copy of Mein Kampf that he's gotten. It says here, Franklin Roosevelt, the White House, 1933. So Roosevelt early on sees we're gonna have trouble with Hitler and he sees that Hitler um, is, uh, you know, what he believes to be the biggest threat uh, to the world, um, you know, in terms of, of peace uh, at, that, uh, at that time. So that's just one document that you're able to put into the hands of, of students. And the Roosevelt administration, of course, you know, they tried to reach out to Hitler and, you know, make, um, you know, uh, concessions, make peace, you know, try to get along um, and, you know, try to bring them into the world uh, as a, um, you know, as a legitimate player. But that never could happen, of course, because of who Hitler was. Now, one of the weird things that I always find about uh, history is, that Franklin Roosevelt and Adolf Hitler come to power within about six weeks of each other, and they die within about six weeks of each other. So you have good and evil on the world stage at precisely the same time, kind of balancing each other out. 
And just as uh, Hitler had solidified his power in Germany um, and was getting ready then to, you know, start to take over the world uh, and, of course, uh, you know, unleash the horrors of the Holocaust, um, Franklin Roosevelt's second term was ending. And um, he was getting ready to, to give up power. So what he decided to do was run for the third term, in part because he didn't think there should be a new president being broken in at a time when Hitler was just getting ready to begin to, to do some of these things. And so that's why Roosevelt ran for the third term. And then, of course, by that time, we're in the war, and he begins uh, and decides that he should probably uh, run for uh, the fourth term um, as, as well. Now, what this curriculum guide does is um, it breaks down the rise of Hitler um, and the, um, the lead up to the Holocaust uh, in different sections. So the first section is about Nuremberg, the trial, and the film. It lays out the importance of images, right? Everybody, the kids today, everything's coming to them through a screen. So when they're able to see this stuff on the screen, it makes a connection to them. It begins to create a, an impact for them. The, section two has got the lead up, which um, again, tells the story of how Hitler was able to come to power. And he was able to come to power, um, you know, through relatively legitimate means, you know, he was elected, he was appointed. I mean, he didn't, uh, you know, he, he, he kind of played by the rules. He played the system, you know, he, he was playing and gaming the system to get to power. And this was so important because what this was, was it was this inch by inch, step by step uh, movement that was um, moving toward this horrible situation and people either didn't recognize it or they didn't stand up to it. Um, in time. Then um, there's a section for uh, Blueprint for World Domination, which talks uh, directly about how um, the Nazis uh, and Hitler were getting ready to, to begin to uh, start this world conquest by backing out of agreements, by backing out of treaties, by double crossing um, allies um, you know, that they had made, and um, really beginning to sow the seeds for this world domination. It's really important to remember that um, in uh, 1941, when the United States joins the war, enters the war with the attack at Pearl Harbor, that the Nazis were all across Europe, they were all across uh, Northern Africa, and um, you know we had a lot of catching up to do. And their allies, the Japanese, were all across the Pacific. So by the time the United States got into the war, um, we had a lot of catching up to do, and you know the Nazis had made a lot of progress in terms of their quest for world uh, domination. And I think that's important for kids to understand that, you know, these guys, uh, you know, yes, ultimately the good guys won, but the bad guys gave it a really good shot. And we came very, very close um, to, to ending up in that, uh, you know, in a world run by, by Hitler. Um, section four is crimes against humanity. And this focuses on particularly the, um, you know, the horrors of the, of the Holocaust, uh, you know, the work camps, the death camps, um, you know, the, um, the atrocities that were, were uh, propagated upon um, these innocent people, you know, and that's another thing that we need students to really understand. These were innocent people. They were uh, targeted. They were attacked. They were persecuted simply because of who they were, not what they had done, but who they were. And it was just pure hate that was driving this, this whole thing. Um, section five is a section on uh, the Roosevelt administration, action and inaction. And this addresses the very critical element and the very critical role of the Roosevelt administration. Again, for many, many years, um, you know, there's sort of been these two camps, folks that think Roosevelt did everything he could do, folks that didn't think uh, Roosevelt uh, did enough. And I'll tell you, quite frankly, I've looked at all this material, and there are days that I get up and I say, well, you know what, he did everything he could possibly do. And then I'll go back a couple of weeks later, and I'll look at something else, and I'll think, well, you know what, maybe he could have done uh, a little more. This is something that, you know, historians are going to have to argue about, um, you know, for forever, uh, really. But what this curriculum guide does is it puts into the hands of you, the teachers, um, the evidence, the documents, the material, uh, so you can take a look at that. And then this, the final section, section six, is um, essential questions surrounding the Holocaust themes and concepts. And this is where we do the current connection. This is where it gets into the things that are going on um, you know, in the news uh, today. Now, you know, it's, you know, as, as um, 
as Karen had said in the in the opening uh, introduction and in her her welcome, you know, we don't have to wait to see this. We don't have to go far to see this. It's in the newspapers every day. It's on television every day. This is not something that's ever very far from us. Uh, this anti-Semitism, this hatred, uh, this, this blaming, this us and them, these sorts of things. It's going on all around us and we need to be able to recognize that. And we need to get our students to be able to recognize that. And if they can recognize that in our own time here today, I think they'll be better able to understand how it happened uh, back uh, in that time uh, as well. So those are the sections of the curriculum guide. And what you're gonna be able to do with this is you're gonna be able to use these primary sources. So I showed you the flyleaf from FDR's copy of Mein Kampf. Here is a report, I will show you this. Here is a report that is uh, included in this. And this is actually, um, it's the blueprint for world domination. So this is a report that was put together based upon the Nazi reports about how Hitler was gonna go ahead and you know, try to take over the world. And when you look at this, um, you know, again, it's, it's probably about 15 pages long. You're not gonna wanna share that whole thing with your students, but what you can do is you can get in here and you begin to look that this was not a mistake. This was not an accident. This was a planned attack against the Jews, a planned attack against the world. Um, they had a plan for this. They had uh, things that they were going to do country by country, the quotas and the things that they were going to do uh, to, to take over these areas and to eliminate the Jewish population uh, in those places. So when you put this in front of the students, they begin to see that you know, this really was a, a planned um, you know, uh, attack. Things happen. You know, people really um, were able uh, to, to plan on how this was going about. You know, this wasn't something that just you know, accidentally happened in history. Here is a copy of a press conference uh, back and forth between the president and the press. So um, it's a transcript. You can see you know, the questions that are being put to the president and how the president is answering those. And again, this is something you need to maybe use with your students. Maybe they could focus in on a particular answer and you could have you know, your students analyze, well, why is the president responding that way? Or you know, why isn't the president responding that way? Or this is material that you can use for your own uh, background uh, information there as well. We've also got um, copies of statements that the president was getting ready uh, to put out. And what's interesting I think about this is some of you are English teachers. We had quite a few English teachers um, who were uh, signed up for the conference today. And what's interesting about this is you can see by looking at the language, you can see by looking at the terminology, you can see by looking at the, the, the way things are phrased, um, you know, how this stuff was written and how this material was, was presented and how it was put forth. So this is a statement that was going to be uh, put out by the um, by President Roosevelt. And um, I wanna share these two with you and I'm gonna read them to you so you get a sense of, of the kind of material that we have on here because I know you can't uh, see it yourself. This, uh, in this particular uh, statement, um, this is the 1938, the president has gotten some news uh, of, of what's gonna be going on, what's going on in Germany. Um, you know, um, with the persecution uh, of, the, of, the, of the Jews by Nazis. And President Roosevelt writes on the bottom of this, I myself could scarcely believe that such things could ever in the 20th, uh, could happen ever in the 20th century civilization. So he's written that right here on the bottom. So he's, he understands that this is happening. He knows these events are, are occurring, you know, in some cases. And yet he can't wrap his mind around it. That was one of the things that we were talking about earlier uh, in one of the sessions, you know, that, you know, how do you, how do you put your mind around this kind of evil? How do you put your mind uh, around this? And we also have documents in here. This is a telegram that was sent to uh, President Roosevelt, and you can have your students look at this. And this will give you an idea of how other people were feeling in the, in the country. This says, Mr. President, you are going too far. You seem to forget that genuine American Gentiles, millions of them are completely unheard because uh, unable, unheard and unable to speak over the Jewish controlled uh, press radio and newsreel, but they do not intend to sit idly by while their country is given away to red Moscow and international uh, Jew war mongers. You may face either a revolution or an impeachment if you continue uh, a cat's paw 
for Washington Jewish minorities. So again, this you could put right in the student in the hands of the students, and it shows you, you know, the, the venom that was coming on the on, on the other side from people in this country. Okay, it, it, what we've tried to do with this is to create a very balanced presentation so that you can see um, what folks were saying pro, what folks were saying uh, con, and you can present that evidence uh, to the students. This next one is a little trigger alert, but here is, um, I wanna show you this, if I can get my camera to work here. The, this is a flyer, a leaflet that was put out by um, a German American Bonn Society. So this is, was circulated here in the United States. Uh, in and among communities to raise uh, support for the Nazis, to raise support for um, Hitler, to raise support for um, that sort of hate and, 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 uh, and persecution right here in this country. So again, this was something that wasn't going on in a far off, you know, distant place in a far off time. These kinds of things were going on right here in the United States. And here is a report that was put together that shows, I know it's hard for you to see this, but if you go to the website, you can download all of these documents, you can use them in class. Um, but what this shows is uh, the percentage of, of support that the, uh, you know, the Hitler regime was getting from the German American community uh, here on the East Coast in the central part of the country and on the West Coast uh, as well. So Roosevelt was working to try to fight this anti-Semitism um, in this country, but there was a great deal of anti-Semitism uh, in the country um, as, as well. And so what we're hoping to be able to do with this is to give you the resources to pre present both sides of the story uh, in a way that um, you know, really goes to address the fact that, well, you know, you're only showing us certain documents or you know, how come you're not showing the other side of this? Here is the other side of this that we're able to, uh, to take a look at. Now, the final section focuses in on the civic aspect uh, of this material. And we have uh, about 26 key concepts that uh, you can address with the students. And you know, just like uh, with Dave and Paula, you know, this idea of telling the story as grandchildren or children of the survivors and making it real and making it intimate and making it authentic to that particular student. That's what gets the message across. And so what we've done is we've laid out these 26 um, uh, topic ideas that you can begin to address with students contemporarily and then take it directly back to what was going on with the Nazis. So if you talk to students about bullying, right? Uh, most of the curriculums uh, in the country these days, you know, are addressing this idea of bullying, cyberbullying, bullying in school. You know, um, a lot of these school shootings are the result of, you know, kids that have been bullied, these sorts of things. Kids understand bullying, and you can get them to understand bullying in their own lives. Have you ever been bullied? Have you ever been picked on just because of who you are, or what you look like, or um, the way you dress, or any other reason? then you begin to get a small understanding of what it was like for folks uh, during the Holocaust. They were being bullied and picked on simply because uh, who, they, uh, who they were. The idea of bearing witness. You know, one of the things that we've seen so much uh, recently is, uh, you know, these videotapes of, you know, of uh, you know, police altercations, those sorts of things, right? You know, um, the fact that we can get things on videotape tells an entirely different story then, um, you know, if it's just he said, she said, he said, you know, she said. And so this idea of, you know, the way video is being used today is exactly the way video would, and film was used during the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the filmmaking and the trial uh, at Nuremberg, right? You know, now you're actually seeing this stuff, this idea of bearing witness, right? This idea of telling the story, of seeing it with your own eyes, of, of showing it over and over again, of, of coming at it from different angles. These are all very important uh, ideas. Critical thinking, right? This ability to take 
facts. First, you've got to find facts. And one of the wonderful things I think about this conference today is we're getting so many uh, resources where you can find facts, documents, evidence, uh, you know, so you're going to have those things first and foremost. You have to be able to find this material. You have to be able to uh, evaluate this material. You have to be able to compare this material to other material that's out there in the field so that you'll get a better understanding of where the, um, you know, the, the overlap is and where the truth becomes clearer. You know, the truth uh, is always someplace in between. And you can't just pick up and hold up one document or one piece of evidence or one artifact or tell one story and think you have the whole story. And one of the things that we're really finding with students, and I know you guys are finding this in your classes as well, <clears throat> is this ability to, to uh, the, the students lacking this idea of critical thinking, you know, the need to be able to evaluate, not just told something, but to be able to evaluate it and analyze it as well. The idea of empathy, putting yourself in somebody else's place, the idea of understanding uh, culpability that, um, you know, many of the folks that participated uh, in this Holocaust uh, were folks who were culpable uh, in, in what was going on there. You know, they may not have planned it, they may not have directed it, but they were engaged in it. And, you know, where does that begin? Where does that end? What level do you approach that with? Hate speech. Right. You know, much of this stuff began with hate speech, you know, us and them. You know, we're not like them. They are different than us. So when you begin to scapegoat people, when you begin to talk hate speech, when you begin to tell that innocent little joke that's not hurting anybody, it is hurting people. And it does begin to build up. It's a small drip, drip, drip to this larger flow um, that can become, um, you know, uncontrollable and, and get out of uh out of control. And it all, you know, begins with this slippery slope, you know, this idea of, um, well, this isn't going to hurt anybody, or this isn't so bad. But once these things begin to be built upon each other, then it becomes, um, you know, unstoppable. Words matter. Propaganda is all around us. We are constantly being told what to think, how to feel, how to react you know, uh, what we're supposed to, to um, you know, participate in, what we're not supposed to participate in. Students need to understand that uh, influences and things that are going on today were very similar to the influences and things that were going on um, during the time of the Holocaust and leading up uh, into Hitler. That's why it is so important that we build civic engagement and civic understanding. We as citizens, uh, Dave had mentioned earlier, today is, is um, election day, right? You have a voice. You need to make that voice heard. And we need to get students to understand that. And we need to understand, get students to understand something that, that Eleanor Roosevelt said, which was very important. She said, human rights uh, begin in small places, so small in fact that they can't be seen on maps or globes. And what that means is that you know, human rights, this ability to have empathy, to care, to understand, to seek to understand, to find what unites you, not what divides you, can begin right where you are. You don't have to be a president. You don't have to be a first lady. You don't have to be a world body in order to make change. We begin to make it happen right where we are, in our schools, in our classrooms, in our communities, uh, you know, in, our, in our counties, in our states. This is where it all has to begin. And one of the things I think is so amazing and wonderful about what you're all doing every single day is you're helping to build that idea of, uh, of civic engagement, civic involvement, and the importance of that. And I know that teachers have been through the ringer over the last year and a half you know, with the, the pandemic and the pressures that that has brought uh, against you uh, in terms of what you're doing in the classroom. And I thank you, and I, I really, you know, totally appreciate what you're doing. The Roosevelt Presidential Library uh, appreciates what you're doing in the classroom every day, and we are here as a resource. I would love if you were to take a look at this curriculum guide, begin to use this material in class. Use it however you want. You can use it as the whole arc of what uh, occurred. You can use it as bits and pieces. It's broken up into bite-sized sections. Uh, each section has vocabulary uh, relevant to that particular section so that um, you know, students, if they're not familiar with these words, you've got the words there. You've got the definitions there as well.
There's primary source documentation in here. There are document-based questions that you can show the student and then ask them to answer those questions. There are short answer questions that you can have the students answer just from um, having either watched the film or looking at the documents. We've tried to make it in a way that you can take this now and make this part of your overarching uh, approach to, uh, to teaching the Holocaust. But what you're going to be able to do is to bring in authentic resources, authentic films, and credible um, documents from credible uh, sources that have uh, existed since the end of the war. So this is, uh, we believe, a great bulwark against um, the revisionist histories and things uh, that are going on. We need to determine the facts. We need to determine the context. We need to determine the questions that we need to ask. And we believe that this cur curriculum guide uh, is a good step uh, to begin with that. So I'll open it up to any questions or, or comments from anybody that you, uh, you might have. Any questions, comments, snide remarks? When I was putting this together, you know, of course, I had to read a lot of these documents, you know, and I've got a history degree and, you know, I know my history, you know, pretty well. But when you really get down into the weeds and stuff, when you really begin to hold in your hand, you know, the, the press releases and, you know, the original, um, you know, documents and and see what was going on with this stuff, it really begins to um, to fill out the story and it really begins to um, to bring it to, to life. Um, and what's interesting about this is it brings it down to a, a more detailed uh, orientation, uh, you know, for, for students. So we're getting some comments. Uh, oh, the little girl on the cover. This little girl on the cover. I love this little girl. This little girl is my hero. And here is this little girl. She has just been liberated from one of the camps. And uh, this picture kind of cuts it off, but she's showing the tattoo on her arm, right? Her prisoner number, right? Her, when her humanity was taken away for who she was and she became nothing more than a number. And she was liberated and here she is, she's showing her number. And I just love that expression on her face. You know, she is a survivor. She has made it. She is staring down the Nazis. She's staring down Hitler. You know what, you guys, you tried, it didn't work. We have made it, we're here, we're gonna tell the story and we're gonna prevent this kind of thing from happening again. I love this, this little girl is my hero. And I just found out this morning that um, she actually uh, grew up to have uh, you know, a, a full life, which is wonderful, right? That was the idea of, of, um, you know, of surviving, right? To, to live your life, to make it happen, um, you know, so that they didn't win. And Jeffrey, yeah. yes. Uh, the content, which is tremendous, and I see chat comments about how wonderful it is too. Uh, it's obviously uh, you talk about critical thinking. This is a very, this is deep. This is uh, you know, this is not middle school, perhaps level content. Uh, have you have you thought that people uh, in the public or in your organization? might take some of that content and find ways to purpose it towards a younger audience? Can you envision taking themes or lessons or, uh, you know, specifics and, and uh, gearing it towards a younger audience? Do you think there's a benefit in doing that? I think there's absolutely a benefit in doing that. <clears throat> One of the things that we really need to do is we need to get these kids when they're young. We need to begin to instill, you know, hatred is instilled in kids when they're little, right? Kids aren't born hating anything except maybe naps, right? Other than that, they're taught to hate and they can be taught not to hate and they can be taught to be empathetic and they can taught to be, be taught to be critical thinkers. So section six is where that happens uh, in the curriculum guide, uh, Jonah. So, you know, I'm not going to say, you know, I mean, there's images of, of people being beaten up you know, you're not going to show that to, let's say, a second grader, but you can talk about the fact that, you know, these Nazis were bullies. And what FDR did was he stood up to Adolf Hitler, who was the world's biggest bully, who um, was just out there to make trouble for people because he was a jerk and because uh, he had hate in his heart against people. And so by by talking about that in terms like that, like, you know, the playground bully, 
you can then take a concept like Hitler, the ultimate evil, and bring it down to something that happens right there um, in the schoolyard. Clearly, this is probably for you know um, high school, junior high school uh, level students, but it's up to the teacher. One of the things that we try to do with all of our education material is I was a classroom teacher before I got this job, but I've not been in the classroom now for over 20 years, 21 years. So you know what your students are up against. You know what you are up against uh, in terms of their background, their, uh, their foundation, their base, what they're going to be able to handle, what they're not going to be able to handle. So what we're trying to do with this is to put in your hands the, uh, the primary source resources, the background and the content, and then you can then take that and um, disassemble that and bring it into the classroom in ways that you think it will work. We're not here to dictate to you how that's going to happen, but it's an opportunity for you to bend and shape that. And section six uh, of this speaks much to that uh, idea of um, of the civic engagement and talks about things I think that that any student from, you know, I mean, kids understand fairness, right? You know, from the time you're in kindergarten, you line up to get a drink at the water fountain. Well, you know, um, you can't be pushing and shoving people out of the way. There has to be order. There has to be uh, rules. There has to be, um, you know, uh, these kinds of things to, pro to provide safety and protection. And when these things get broken apart, when these things get taken apart or taken away, then the safety and the protection uh, disappears. And that's, again, uh, you know, one of the themes that we're trying to get across with this. Jeffrey, yes. I, I just want to make a comment that I am completely blown away by the amount of the number of resources available and hats off and kudos to all the teachers who can go through it and create lesson plans tailored to their students from all of this, because I find it completely overwhelming in a very positive way. So hats off to all the teachers out there. Thank you. And just keep in mind, this is a group effort. Um, you know, I mean, I, I wrote the curriculum, but uh, it, the work that went into this was, was a team effort from various members of our staff, our various departments, the museum, uh, the archives, our friends at Drake Creative who, who put together the film so that you're able to show this. And, and I, I'm so proud of that. And I'm so jazzed and excited about that. This is a film that wasn't allowed to be seen in the United States for 65 years, and now it's on our YouTube page. You can bring it right into the classroom this afternoon and begin to use it as a teaching tool. And um, I'm just really excited about that, and I'm so happy and honored and proud to have been a part of that, along with the overarching team. And um, you know, and I, I feel as if I'm, I'm, and I hope you do as well, that I'm a team member with each of you out there in the classroom each and every day uh, as well. And I would be happy to come um, either virtually or you know, when we get back to being in reality, uh, come talk to your class. I could do a virtual uh, session if you'd like to, uh, me to do that, if you'd like me to, you know, approach this material with the students. Um, however, I can be of help to you in the classroom, wherever you are in this country, let me know. That is my job. Oh, Tiffany wants to know, what was the justification for banning the film? Uh, great question. The film was banned because... Um, what the film does is it exposes uh, what the Nazis were doing and it exposes what was going on in Germany. Right after the end of the war, um, the, the United States began this conflict with, with Russia. So almost immediately after came the Cold War. And we needed Germany, because of its physical location, uh, to be a bulwark against the um, the Soviet Union. And so uh, the reason it was banned here was because we needed to get people to recognize, uh, we were kind of on to the next conflict. We needed to get people, the government needed to get people to recognize the Soviets as the bad guy and not the Germans. And um, so it was banned in this country. In Europe, it was seen, and, and many places it was, um, it was uh, you know, seen as a condition to getting your rations, you know, uh, food rations and such because um, they wanted folks to, to understand, here is what happened in your country, in your community. And the reaction that people had from the film was, was varied. Some people said, well, this is just, you know, allied propaganda, and they just poo-pooed it. Others, you know, were like, we can't believe this was going on right here, and we didn't know about this. Others were like, well, I, you know, I knew something was going on, but I had no idea, you know, how bad it was. Others felt, well, okay, it's real, it happened, that was in the past, let's move on and we'll go forth uh, from there. And others felt a, a, 
you know, a deep sense of shame and a deep sense of, of regret that something like this could have happened in their country and um, you know, they didn't do anything to, to stop it. So the reaction to this film was, uh, was across the board, but the reason it was banned in the United States was because we needed to get the, the people of Germany uh, on our side against the, the Soviets um, at that time. So great question. Anything else, anybody else? I, I'll, yeah, I wanna throw a comment on, oh, Laura, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, I just wanted to let all the teachers know that you should take Jeff up on his offer if you need assistance in your classroom. Um, I met Jeff as a teacher and because um, I'm very lucky that the FDR library is right in my backyard and that we have access to it and I've had access to it my whole life. School, Girl Scouts, all these things. And um, it wasn't even my field trip. It was my social studies counterpart. She had a field trip there and that's how I've met Jeff and he is one of the most easygoing, um, awesome people to work with. And if you need a resource, he will do everything in his power to help you get it if he doesn't have it. So, you know, certainly take him up on his offer because it is a genuine one and he's not just saying it for show because he, he has to, he means it. So, um, and especially those of you social studies teachers out there that have to teach civic engagement, that's Jeff's jam. He's all about it and very passionate about it. So please, please consider um, reaching out to the FDR estate because it, it will be worth your while. Hey, Laura, very sweet of you to say. Okay, so let's take a little break and we'll catch up again at the top of the hour.